Reading for April 18th, Science of Mind, A Philosophy, A Faith, A Way of Life by Ernest Holmes. Reading from page 447, paragraph 1, through page 449, paragraph 3, using inclusive language. How to Approach the Spirit If we wish to come to the Spirit for the healing of our wounds, let us come in peace and with spontaneous joy, for the Spirit is joy. Let us come with thanksgiving also, for a thankful heart is in harmony with life. But we must come in quiet confidence, with an open and receptive mind, a believing heart, naturally, sanely, and expectantly. In this way, we are entering the portals of reality, clad in garments of righteousness. We often think what we require is money, friends, and physical healing. After these things do those who are outside a knowledge of the law seek, and they do well, for we need all these things. But they are the efforts of right relationship to life. All people need some form of healing. Most people are unhappy. Few have any realization of permanent peace. We seek fragments when the whole is at hand. How illogical to think that anything can rise higher than its source. The universe is a perfect, undivided whole, and healing can take place only when one is unified with it. How can anyone, then, be healed in part? Let us seek wholeness above all else. If we would come to the universal wholeness, we must approach it through the law of its own nature. This means that we must give our undivided attention to the spiritual unit back of all things. Since all else is included within this unit, we find our particular good only through unity with life. This conscious unity makes our mind receptive to completion, since life itself is complete. This reception is always an inner light, for the individual can only can use only such knowledge as they inwardly possess. In reality, we know God or truth only as we ourselves embody God or truth. And since it is impossible to embody anything outside ourselves, this knowledge must be an inner light. The truth itself is infinite, but we only embody the finite in degree. The degree that we do embody reality, we become poised and powerful. The purpose of the science of mind. The whole purpose of the science of mind is to reconcile the apparent separation of the spiritual world, which must be perfect, with the material world, which appears imperfect. The spiritual world is the cause of the material. We are spiritual beings governed by mental law. Only that world can appear to us which we mentally perceive. Our experience is the logical outcome of our inner vision. Our horizon is limited to the confines of our own consciousness. Wherever this consciousness lacks a true perspective, its outward expression will lack proper harmony. This is why we are taught to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, since no one lives by proxy, but each unto ourselves, every individual must make the test in our own soul. And Jesus knew their thoughts, Matthew 12, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts, that is, he had an extended vision which enabled him to know what others were thinking. He had healed a man possessed of unclean thoughts, and the priests had reasoned within themselves that his power to do this was one of the evil one. Jesus' understanding 
what was in their minds, told them that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And if he cast out evil by the power of evil, then evil would be a house divided against itself. But, he said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. We cannot do good while we continue to do evil, nor can we heal evil except by the power of good. To all sincere students of science of mind, this lesson is a guidepost pointing to the fact that the thought of good must ever overcome any thought that is less than good. By the presence of good, evil is cast out, just as by the presence of light, the darkness disappears. Good thoughts and a good harvest. Matthew chapter 7, verses 17, 18. A good tree produces good fruit, so good thoughts bear a harvest of good deeds, while evil consumes itself in the flame of its own fire. If one's life produces good deeds, then the one is themselves good, and this, no matter what their particular religious belief may or may not be. The mouth speaks from the heart. It is impossible for a person to conceal themselves. In every act, word, or gesture, they stand revealed as they are, and not as they would have themselves appear to be. From the universe, nothing is or can be hidden. The very walls have ears, and the mirror of life cannot help reflecting back to us that which we really are. Jesus plainly tells us that we are held accountable for the very words which we speak. No one ever lived who placed a greater power in the word. By our words we are justified or condemned. The word may be considered to be the complete thought and act of people. There must be a thought before there can be an act, and a thinker before there can be any thought. The thinker condemns or justifies themselves through their thought. 